birth of time, Jesus had you on his mind, so you never need to question his concern. So what can separate him from the precious love of God, and who could ever come? Thanks, Sister Johnson, for singing to us this morning. The message of the song is beautiful. Nothing can separate us from God's love. Thank you. I just want to say to you that this is more than a song. It is a fact. It's a fact. And it is a fact that Christians must embrace that nothing can separate us from God's love. This is not, this is not a theory of somebody saying. 
This is a fact from the conference room of heaven that you have to break your own arm out of the hand of God. Because when God takes a hold of you, he does not let you go. And even when you are broken, you are broken in his hands. So it's a wonderful song with a wonderful message. And we want to thank Sister Johnson for singing it to us and reminding us of the beauty of God's love. This morning I want to speak to us on the subject, Joy to the World. Joy to the World. And I want to take a minute and welcome um, uh, uh, young lady Beard this morning. We welcome you. You've not been here for a minute and we've missed you and we know that you're attending Miami University and this is the end of a semester so we're hoping everything went well and we're praying for you and we love you. Welcome. God bless you and of course to my friend and to your dad and to your brother as well. Thanks for being here. Joy to the world. Open your Bibles, please. Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. And I have selected three verses out of the text that was read this morning. Luke chapter 2 and verse 10. And we will read verse 11. And verse 13 and verse 14. Luke chapter 2, 10, 11, 13, and 14. You know the previous verses and the context of verse 10. The shepherds are in the field watching over their flocks by night. And out of the clear blue sky, a woman named Mary who was engaged to a man named Joseph and before they were married she got pregnant and she gave she's in her third trimester but there is a decree that the whole world should be taxed and, and you go back to your city wherever that was and because Joseph from, was from the line and lineage of David he had to go to the city of David Bethlehem or Bethlehem First of all, I, I cannot resist the bit. This is not my sermon, but let's go back to verses 1 and 2. Let's go back and, and watch this phenomenon. And we will preach that at another time, but I want to highlight it to you. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Look at Caesar. What a command does this guy think he is? He gives a command that the whole world should be taxed. That's a different sermon. And in verse 2, the Bible tells us that that had been happening since Quirinius was governor of Syria. Commanding people outside of the country to be taxed. So let's go to our sermon. There's something to think about when you're having dinner today. Let's go to verse 10. And in the light of all of that stuff, Mary is in her third trimester, but she too has to go up to Bethlehem to be counted and taxed. And while she was in Bethlehem, she the time came for her to be delivered. The shepherds are in the fields and they have no clue what's happening. But heaven knows and the Bible says at the same time when Mary was giving birth to Jesus in the manger an angel was dispatched from heaven he blew his way through the stratosphere into Bethlehem. And he is announcing something special to some lowly shepherds. 
When the shepherds saw the angel, the Bible says they were scared. You would be too. In the middle of the night, you see this, this, this glorious, majestic figure with power all around him. You would want to run. But watch our text as we talk about joy to the world. The angel said to the shepherds, the angel, do not be afraid. And, and in the Greek it is even stronger. Stop being afraid. Stop. Because this event is not about fear. The angel said, I'm not here to beat you. I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to frighten you. I am here because I bring you good news. Oh, you're not hearing me this morning. Good news of great joy. That's not just for you. But that will be for all the people. Here it comes. Today, in the city or in the town of David, a savior has been born. And I like, I like the last part of the statement. He's not just born. He's born to you. This is not about a woman who, who is given arbitrary birth. He's not just born. This is not a, just another little boy. This is a savior given to you. And he is Christ the Lord. Oh, happy day. And while the angel is announcing the good news. The other angels who had been marking time in heaven wishing they could come. To be part of this tremendous event. The Bible says suddenly the, the canvas of heaven was rolled away and a great company appeared with the angel and declared themselves to be a praise team. Hallelujah. Praising God. And the Bible tells us the song that they sang. Glory to God in the stratosphere. And that's actually the word. That's translated highest. Glory to God up to the stratosphere. And on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Now that part of the verse is exclusionary. Everybody doesn't have peace. We'll talk about that in a minute. But those on whom his favor rests. <laughs> they have peace. Now father. You brilliant and you awesome. You gave Jesus to us. And our hearts and souls are made glad. Now in the next few minutes, God speak. For we are listening. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, our text for today tells a story of the long ago. But the story that our text tells is as Powerful today as it was in the long ago. When it was first proclaimed. Proclaimed in the ordinary setting of the hill country of Palestine. And declared by an angel to lowly shepherds. It's a story of the unfamiliar and God's new thing. The table is turned. God has declared a second phase of war against the kingdom of darkness. 
This time he himself is leading the charge in the fight. For in this story, brothers and sisters, the impossible is now possible. The improbable is now probable. The implausible is now plausible. And humanity will receive a gift as a result. Isaiah's question of who shall believe our report some 600 years prior is now answered. When Isaiah saw it through the tunnel of prophetic vision, he asked who can believe our report. But on that night in the city of David, in the city of Bethlehem, that prophetic question of 600 years earlier was answered. Humanity will now believe this report. For unto us this day in the city of David is born a savior who is Christ the Lord. Nobody is born anything. You become something. I was not born a preacher. Maybe I was born to preach. But I was not born a preacher. You were not born a teacher. You were not born a nurse. Or a lawyer. You became that. But Jesus was born what he would become. He was born a king. Have you ever heard of anybody who was born a king? You are born a prince. And then at the death of your parent, you become king. But he was born a king. He, he would not become a savior. But he was born a savior. That's why there is power in his name. That's why there is deliverance in his name. That's why, that's why there is salvation in his name. Paul says in Romans chapter 10, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He was born what he would be. That's why you cannot Talk about him like an ordinary person. I scringe when I hear preachers and teachers and religious people who want to make themselves perfect talked about Jesus as if he was just like them. You were born your raggedy self and you are still your raggedy self. He was born a king. That's why he's still a king. He's the king of kings and he's the lord of lords. Unto us this day in the city of David is born a savior. He's Christos Curios, Christ the Lord. That's why I love him so. That's why I, I would leave my food and eat other people's food and eat fish that's not well seasoned. Mercy, Lord. Only for my Lord, man. Live in a little room for weeks. Yeah. It is my it is my living room, my bedroom, my sitting room, my dining room. You know, I love to watch my news. When I, get to, when I got to French Guyana, brethren, um, and this is nothing on my brethren. They treated me well. When I got to the airport, the union president and the conference president were there to greet me. So it's not as if it was second class anything. It was pretty good. A big name, pastor, St. Rose, and I'm looking, who are you? Oh, I'm the... I'm the French until his union. Oh, excuse me. Why are you here? I'm here to meet you. Oh. Thank God the prophet is without honor, only at home. That's not in the sermon. 
And understand, understand, I'm not complaining, but I'm in this room and I love to watch the news. And at that time, Miami was not losing anything. So I wanted to see them play, um, especially to beat Chicago and the Lakers and everybody else's team. That's not a hit. <laughs> and I put on the television. Bonjour, monsieur, bonjour, madame, les nouvelles des I said, Lord God, that's in French. And I switched the channel, it's still in French. Six channels on the TV, all in French. No Miami hit basketball. You know for three weeks that was hard. <laughs> Man, Lamar, that was tough. But for my Lord, kick. Anything for him. Because he, is, he has been given to me. And where I am makes no difference. He is given to me. Isaiah's question is now answered. God has become man and has taken man's place. And watch this. And like Adam, the husband of Eve, if he fails, humanity fails with him. But if he wins, humanity wins with him. That's why you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who loves you so. Because he won that fight. And on the cross, he defeated the devil. Defeated him. The devil is defeated. The cross crushed him. That's why you are free and I am free. Free, free, free. I have been set free. For I have met the man. The man from Galilee. He took away my sin. My heavy load of sin. And now I'm shouting glory. Hallelujah. For who the son sets free. Is free indeed. Oh, I met Jesus one day and I met him for myself and I know that I am free today. You see, on that hill in Bethlehem, it was Christmas. Now, let's not get into December 25. We know December 25, the shepherds were not out there. But let's, let's stay with concept. Yes, the first Christmas and an angel will summarize all time and all epochs into two simple verses of our text in the Christmas story. What a night it was. Don't you wish sometimes that you were there? What a night. Joseph Moore wrote about that night in 1818 when he wrote, Silent night. Holy night. All is calm yet all is bright. What the angel said in the two verses of our text summarizes the kingdom of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's go to verse 10 of our text. And as I was doing a little bit of reflection about preaching that, that sermon and that text, I, did, I got curious. I got curious when I read what the angel said in verse 10. But the angel said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news. And I wanted to see in the Greek if, if what word was used for the, that good news. And I was shocked to discover that it is the same word. Where is my word? I thought I had my word up there. It is the same word that is used for gospel. Where is my word? Here is the verse. And the angel said to them, May for best to not be afraid, for I bring you Hey, it is, hey, it is, hey, it is. I bring you the evangelism. I bring you the good news. 
I bring you the gospel. Oh my Lord, my Lord, my Lord. On that night, what the angel said was the gospel. He said, I bring you, we can rephrase. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid or stop being afraid. For I bring you the gospel. And what is it? What is it? And then he says, the gospel will be great joy for all people. Brethren, the declaration of the angel was the gospel. Could you believe that? The gospel is simpler than we make it. Let me say that again. The gospel is as simple as Sunday morning. Oh, for those of us, as Sabbath morning. The but watch what he said. He says, stop being afraid. Because I bring you the gospel. So the gospel dispels fear. If you have a fear in your salvation experience as to whether you are going to make it, you have not yet received the gospel. If you teach a doctrine that gives fear to the people relative to their salvation, you are not preaching the gospel. The gospel dispels fear. And on that lonely night, that jolly night, that holy night, that bright night in Bethlehem, the angel said, I bring you the gospel. Good news. Two things shout out to us. Firstly, the Christmas story is the gospel and secondly, it dispels fear. The gospel is etched in the very heart of what God is doing in salvation history. Any teaching or preaching that gets us afraid is not the gospel. No wonder Jesus asked the church to preach one thing and one thing only. The gospel. Now we're preaching all kinds of crazy things. My brothers and my sisters, those of us who teach and preach, hear me and hear me well, preach the gospel. Stop preaching about whether a woman has powder on her face. Preach the gospel. The gospel will handle that. Stop preaching about whether a woman's fingernail is painted or not. Preach the gospel. And the gospel will take care of that. Stop preaching about the food that you like vis-a-vis -vis the food that somebody else likes. The kingdom of heaven is not about food and drink, but it's about joy in the Holy Spirit. So if you want to be a vegan, be a vegan. If you want to be a vegetarian, be a vegetarian. If you want to eat your food raw, eat it raw. But let me eat my salmon. Because the kingdom of heaven is not about a piece of fish. Preach the gospel. On the night when a world is lost. And mankind is grouping in darkness. The angel said, I bring you the gospel. Well, what is it? A savior has been born. That's the gospel. We preach all kinds of contortions. We make the Bible say things it never intended to say. We disrespect the scripture to suit our doctrines. In the name of the gospel, preach the gospel. 
You cannot pay me enough money to preach your stuff. When I'm so old and I can hardly stand up and somebody has to read for me. When I'm so old that I cannot stand in the pulpit and somebody has to help me, I'll still be preaching the gospel. I'll not preach your gospel. I'll preach his gospel. For your gospel is a burden and a pain. But his yoke is easy and his burden is light. We make difficult what God has made easy. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Take your eyes off of people's clothes. And preach the gospel. The gospel that supposedly changed you will change them. There are some people who don't give their family members gifts. Even at Christmas time. And they don't have a problem with that. That's their family. And it's dynamic. But there are other people who don't want their boo to leave. Mm -hmm. So the nice gifts. Under the tree. Uh -huh. Nordstrom type gifts. Own to those who have to do it, but your relationship determines how your life will be. If you love your spouse, there is nothing you wouldn't do for your spouse. There is no rule in any house that says, make sure. On the 35th birthday, you get perfume. On the 36th, you get a dress. On the 37th, you get shoes from Macy's. There is no rule. You do it because the relationship means something to you. I don't drink rum. Although I have mimicked drunkards to the confusion of some people. I remember in Bible study one night, I was given an illustration about what the drunks, how they walk, how they bend, and what they say. And after the service, somebody said, well, pastor, you, you did that so very well. Is there something we should know? <laughs> because I love my Lord. That's why I don't drink rum. I don't do drugs. Because I love my Lord. There is no rule in any church that says I can't take a spliff and get a high. And even if there is a rule that says that, you think when I leave church, your rule goes with me? But I don't do it because I want my mind protected. I love my Lord. I don't run the streets like I'm a vagabond. And I'm homeless. Because I love my Lord. There is not anything anybody wants to do in this world that I don't want to do. But I don't because I love my Lord. The relationship that we have causes me to not do certain things. When you preach the gospel and people begin to love the Lord, they will do things you cannot make them do. That's why we preach the gospel. Paul says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, this one thing I do, preach the gospel. But no, we want to control people instead. We want them to be just like us, dress like us, talk like us, eat like us, be fancy like us. And we think because we worship at the temple of sameness, then we are saved, please. 
It's the gospel that saves. The angel said to the shepherds, Stop being afraid because I bring you the gospel. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord. When Jesus was born, the gospel was preached. When Jesus was ascended, he said to his disciples, preach the gospel. And it is the gospel of the kingdom that shall be preached into all the world. For a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. They almost threw out my brother in St. Lucia out of a Sabbath school class last week. I have warned him. I have told him that he's not a pastor. And the only reason why I have not been thrown out is because I am a pastor. And I have said to him, he will not a pastor. Be careful and know your place. He took his fast self in the people's lesson study and began talking about the gospel. And the people in the lesson study didn't like that. They asked him to be quiet because he's disrupting the class. So I asked him to tell me what he said. And what he said, brothers and sisters, was the pure, unadulterated gospel. But we have taught so much junk in the past that we cannot even recognize the gospel when it is preached. Just like the Jews. So he's all ashamed and embarrassed. His reputation is on the line. So he calls me for relief. I said, man, I'm in Columbus, Ohio. No relief you shall find. Stop interfering with the people. I am fascinated by this. I didn't know this until 5 o'clock this morning. That this is the word. Behold, I bring you the gospel. Let me hurry. Let me tell you what the gospel is. The gospel is God's doing. The gospel, brothers and sisters, is the good news about God. Uh huh. The gospel is the truth about God. And the truth about his salvation. The gospel is the truth about the cross. And what God has done. Therefore, we should preach Christ crucified. Not our own stuff. I've been to churches and I never introduced myself other than by the name God my mother gave me. I don't hang around the titles. So I walk into churches and I sit in Sabbath school classes and I ha actually have to turn around to see where in the world is Carmelo San Diego? Where am I? Is this a church that believes in Jesus? I sat in a Sabbath school class in Germany one day and the class was being taught by a Caucasian brother. God bless his heart, I know he meant well. And he was there and he, for 25 minutes, he pounded the Sabbath through our foreheads into our cranium. And I put up my hand when I got tired. I was at the point of saturation and I said, and I, he took my hand, he, you have a question? Yes, brother, I do. I, I, and I asked him a, 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 a serious question. I said, which is more important, the Sabbath or Jesus? I know he got all messed up. And he did, but, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. God gave you two ears and a mouth, which means that you should listen twice as much as you speak. 
the problem with us sometimes is that we, 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 we speak so much that we don't hear and we speak so much that we don't think. He didn't think of the question that I asked him. He just blurted an answer. His answer, they are equally important. That is somebody who is teaching other people. Telling them that the Sabbath is just as important as Jesus. Well, no. Jesus is more important, brethren. Uh -huh. The Sabbath we ought to keep, but guess what? It cannot save you. You can keep it from now until the chickens come home to roost. It cannot save you. The only person that can save is Jesus. Take the world. Take your doctrines. Take your church. But give me Jesus. Because anywhere with Jesus is a house of praise. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. The people who live in the jungles of the great Amazon. They don't have calendars and clocks and wall-to-wall -wall carpet in air conditioning churches. But they have a sense for God. And because they have a sense for God and they believe in God, they are God's children just like you. gospel is the good news about God. It's, it's the truth about God. It's the truth about the cross and what God has done. Therefore, we should preach the gospel, not our own stuff, but the gospel. The gospel, listen to this, listen to this, listen to this now. The gospel is not about your church, but it's about your Christ. Your church didn't save you. Oh, I know you... I, <laughs> I think everybody is going home to lunch. Your church didn't save you. Jesus saved you. It's not about your doctrines. It's about your deliverer. It's not about you. It's about your God. And we must preach that. There is no Christmas, therefore, without the gift of the gospel. Come on, you can say amen. Stop being afraid when you have the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stop being timid when you have the gospel. Stop being unsure of your salvation when you have accepted the gospel. Don't listen to anybody who tells you you should not say you are saved. What kind of story is that? The gospel saves if you have accepted Jesus, you are saved. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite, favorite texts, let's go to it quickly, we'll go back to look. John 5, 24, one of my favorite texts. One of my favorite texts. Now, if somebody doesn't want to say they are saved, don't harass them. That's them. But you should know in whom you have believed. And you should know whether you are saved or not. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. I want you to know that what I'm about to say is the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes on whom who sent me, not will have, not had, not may have, not would have, not an imperfect, not an auxiliary, not a future tense. It says you have eternal life. What about that? That's difficult. Put your head in the wood. Put your head in the wood. And then, if you think that's all he says, he says you will not be condemned. But check out the last part. You've made a transition. You've moved from the book of death to the book of life. You've moved from judgment to salvation. You've moved from death to life. 
life. What about that? That's difficult. If you believe on Jesus, you are saved. Hmm. And that's what he's called me to preach. Allegheny West pays me every month. And I'm glad they do. But they didn't tell me what to preach. Jesus told me what to preach. Because what I preach is bigger than Allegheny West. What I preach, Allegheny West cannot do. So we preach Christ crucified. I don't know about you, but I have crossed over from death to life. Stop being afraid when you have Jesus. Because the gospel is not about fear. It is about, it's not about law. It's about love. The law of the kingdom of God is love. Let me tell you a text that will almost give Adventist people a migraine. This clever guy goes to Jesus one day and he says to Jesus, which is the greatest commandment? I know what every Seventh-day Adventist is expecting him to say. And he disappointed them all. Because brethren, as important as God's law is, the law of the kingdom is love. Love to God and love to man. Now you can break that and divide it among the commandments and say the first four relate to God and the last six relate to your fellow men. You can say that. But what is important is that he did not give the answer that this guy expected him to give. As a matter of fact, he quoted the Shema, the word I used for the call to worship this morning, Deuteronomy 6.4. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And he said the second most important is like unto it, love your neighbor. Love God and love your neighbor. Jesus says, by this shall all men know that you are my people. If you not keep the Sabbath. If you love one another. Now, don't get it twisted. Don't think for a second I'm knocking down the Sabbath and I'm saying it's not important. Oh, please. If that's all you get, you need to go home right now. What I'm suggesting to you is. The supremacy of Christ in our salvation experience. That Jesus is more important than anything we teach or preach. That's why Paul says, this one thing I do, I preach Christ and him crucified. And what I'm saying to us is let us stop preaching everything else that God has not asked us to preach. Every time a little war breaks out somewhere, people get nervous. Oh, Jesus, is all, I can hear the wind of his coming, please. You can hear the wind? The wind you're hearing is the wind from the Great Lakes. Because what Kim, Kim, Kim Jong-il last week executed his uncle. The second highest ranking member of the North Korean government, his own uncle, they charged him for all kinds of silly crimes and they killed the man. People are nervous. Oh, Jesus, Jesus is coming. Oh, Lord Jesus. In 1990, I was, 1992 or 1993 it was, I was at Andrews University 
theological seminary, and the Pope had sent out a letter, the Pope who died, Pope John Paul II, three popes ago. Three popes ago, he sent out a letter to his bishops, and a 35-page letter, I have it in a folder in my study, it's a letter where the, the the conference president of the Catholic Church is telling the pastors to preach more about the sacredness of Sunday. What is wrong with a pope telling his bishops that? Tell people, stop going to the stores and spend more time in reflection. That's their teaching. That's their stuff. People got so nervous about that. Oh, you see, the mark of the beast is a po Sit down. Just sit your anxious self down and stop getting the rest of us scared over nothing. Just sit down. When we do things like that, we give the impression that we don't know our Bibles. Because Jesus says, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars and pestilences and sicknesses and rivers are overflowing and the ocean is mad and, 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 and tsunami here and tsunami there, an earthquake there, an earthquake here, the end is not yet. Signs of the times. Not the sign of the end. Signs of the times. When didn't we have a war? Human beings have been fighting and killing each other from the time they were born. Adam's son went ghetto. Cain, brother Cain, one generation removed from the hands of God, went ghetto and killed his own brother and said he was not loved. All these nonsense stories you're hearing about all these People who were just killing people and say, well, my, my daddy didn't like my mommy. Really? That's why you killed 16 kids? Wow. Oh, well, uh, I, I, the girls didn't talk to me. Huh? Well, my daddy and my mommy are always fighting, and I couldn't get the attention when I wanted to. And you picked up a machine gun? You didn't go to the police station and say, Mr. Police Officer, I need my mommy and my daddy to talk to me. You didn't go to your school principal. You didn't go to your church. You didn't talk to your pastor. You pick up a weapon, and then you go and kill other people because your mommy and, my, and, and, your, your, mommy and your daddy are not talking to you. You're just a bad person, and Elwin should be your judge. But you see, Elder Harrison, they would never let me be your judge because I've not yet been to law school. <laughs> People sit in churches for decades and cannot define the gospel, and when they hear it, they want to flip because it is not what they believe it to be. Secondly and quickly, I'm getting you out of here in a minute. Secondly and quickly, in verse 10, the angel said something else. The angel said, this gospel I bring is a gospel of great joy. Now, the word here for great is a very interesting word because it is this word right here. This is joy, karan or karas. It is a sister word to the word grace, which is charis, from which you get charisma, charismatic. Grace is an exciting word. And its cousin, joy, is karan, C-H-A-R-A-N. But what's this word? M-E-G-A. Mega. You think it was only the Ohio Lottery that knows about mega? <laughs> mega joy! The gospel is mega joy, mega lane. Mega joy. It's not a little whispering hope. Oh man, I go to churches and we act like we're dead. Holy Spirit, faithful God. And then we sing. How cheering is the creed. 
Man. It's a nice song, but we kill it. If you have the gospel, you have mega joy. Oh, Lord, have mercy. You, you, you are bursting with joy. You are excited. And that's why the little things that are happening around you cannot shake you. Because you have something in you that the world didn't give to you. And the world cannot take it away. You have something in you that you cannot explain. There, there is something in you that can literally stop the rain. You cannot explain it. All that you know is that there is something within you. Because you have mega joy. The, the angel said it is good news and it is mega joy. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord. People who know the gospel are not miserable. Hear me and hear me well. People who know the gospel don't have the time to stop and listen to tail bearing and gossip and lies. People who have the gospel don't get depressed. Oh, pastor, let me, let me tell you what they said about you. And, and all of a sudden, my head sinks in the hollow of my shoulders and my chin falls on my chest. Excuse me. You think you are going to be at home enjoying your favorite TV show and I'm going to be in my house worrying about you? No! 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 Because I have the joy of the Holy Ghost in me. Talk about me. My mother used to say, Dashin leaf, the water rolls. I remember one time this crazy man was harassing my father. I don't remember where we were going. But my father just shook his jacket to speak to that. Man, my parents gave me one of the one of the best gifts they gave me was the gift against bullies. The day when my daddy walked in the classroom and made me punch that bully. He stands tall and he's big and he's taking advantage of me. And when I had enough of him, I told my daddy. And my daddy said, what did he do? He said, daddy hit me. My father said, did he actually put his hands on you? Yes, daddy. And I'm scared. My father said, okay. I'll take care of it tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, he gets up. He's not going to work. He's going to school. My other brothers and sisters are already hiding in the bushes. <laughs> because my daddy is going to school. And I have to walk with him. And I am both scared and embarrassed. I'm thinking of, well, when my daddy leaves, what if this guy puts a pounding on me? And I'm embarrassed because my father is going to the school to, now he never told me what he's going to do. I'm a little guy. I'm thinking my dad is going to talk to the principal. No, 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 no. We get to school, he says, where is your class? He steps into the class. My father was 6'4". He steps into the class. And as loudly as he could speak, he says, who hit you? And I'm looking at the guy. I'm scared now. Don't blame me. You would be too. Because the guy is big and strong. When my daddy leaves, what happened? My father says, who hit you? Oh, he hits you? Yeah. Grabbed me by the hand. Brought me toward the guy and said, hit him. Hit him right back. He said, I said, hit him.
he said, hit him again. And I barely touched the guy. My father said, I told you. Now that tone of voice changed the equation. He says, I told you to hit him. And I hit him. I made full contact. He said, hit him again. And I hit him again. And he said, hit him on his head. And I hit him up by his neck. And he was going down and he fell. And my father stood over him all six, four. And said in words that he could understand. If you ever touch my son again. I'm going to kill you. By which time the school is disrupted, the principal is running, teachers are running helter skelter and everywhere, and he walks out of the room, and I heard the principal calling, Mr. St. Rose, Mr. St. Rose. My father didn't turn back, he kept walking. I know he was fuming. Because if you touch his child, he'll get you. My brothers and my sisters, before Jesus was born, the devil thought, Earth was his playground. He bullied you and he bullied me and he bullied humanity until the cross when, when Jesus said, hit him. And, and we hit him. And he said, hit him. And we hit him because we may be afraid of the devil. But when Jesus is with us, we are not afraid of the bully. When Jesus is in the vessel, we can smile at the storm as we go sailing by. The devil may be a bully, but Jesus is your daddy. Come on, say amen. This thing is not a joke. This is your salvation. And God is vested in you. Oh, let me close it. Let me close it. Let me close it. Great joy. We can talk about great joy until tomorrow. Something sustaining. Something that's powerful and potent. Great joy. That is your strength. Why joy? Why, why joy? The angel answers thirdly in verse 11. Today, this is where you ought to have joy. Because today in the city of David, a savior got my word again. So tell, S-O-T-E-R, long E. E as an A, S-O-T-E-R, savior. The British spell it S-A-V-I-O-U-R. I don't care how you spell it. I don't care how you look at it. You have a savior. My brothers and my sisters, you have a savior. That soter, savior, in, the, in, 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 in Hellenistic times, in ancient times, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the, in the literature, post-New Testament, it was never just somebody who did something for you and left. But your savior was your helper. Your savior was your protector. Your savior was your rescuer. Your Savior stayed with you. That's why the angel said, call his name Jesus.